Okay, so uh, yeah, my name is Jim Wilson, a uh, member of NEAR for several years now uh, from Pennsylvania, so part of the Pennsylvania chapter. Um, this is a presentation, several of film landscapes in Eastern PA and emerging partnerships to preserve and protect them across the state. I gave this presentation last March, a year ago, last month, um, to a, a general audience that had never really heard of Ceremony of Stone Landscapes, and I, I think I called it um, The Mysteries of Constructed Stone Landscapes and Our Weapons and Warriors. And so it was for the Watershed Coalition we had Alley, uh, which I'm a, I'm a charter member. And it's in partnership with my employer, I got to do it on the clock, so I'm sorry, I'm sorry, North Panther County Park and Rack, I was there as a recreation and conservation specialist. And in partnership with NERA, I, I give a big you know, shout out to NERA during the program. Um, you may recognize uh, th this site is, um, these are three features at the Ole Hill site uh, in Pennsylvania. I know Pennsylvania is probably not all that real familiar to most folks with, with uh, ceremony stone landscape outside of the Ole Hill site that's pretty well celebrated. Um, these are huge megalithic sites there, uh, three features. Uh, we did a field trip to this site as well. The Watershed Coalition did that same winter. Um, so if you look at the middle picture there, the middle cairn, it may look familiar to you here. Uh, it graces the cover of Tim Tenrick's um, New Antiquarians video from the series Hidden Landscapes, um, which is a video on the archaeology and legacy of Northeast uh, Native civilizations. So it's a pretty important um, CSL, Ceremonial Stone Landscape. So the partnership piece, and we'll talk a little bit more about that tomorrow, I think, during the update. But the uh, big uh, partnership that NERA has been involved with in recent years is uh, having established a, a working relationship, or at least initiated one, with the Pennsylvania uh, State Historic Preservation Office and the, uh, the Archaeological Site Survey uh, folks there. Um, we will talk again. I'll talk more about that. Um, so uh, the one partner that I do want to bring up right away is the Lenape Nation of Pennsylvania. So um, they, they are not a federal or state recognized tribe, but a nonprofit organization um, really that's dedicated to uh, uh, increasing awareness and, uh, and uh, of Lenape history and culture. So they're a nonprofit organization made up of members who claim Lenape heritage. Um, and they've been at the table in the 20 some years I've been working with um, ceremonial stone landscapes and people connected to that, that swacky world that we all kind of embrace. Uh, some of the other partners locally um, helping to preserve and protect and, and educate more about the subject is uh, the Regional Planning Commission, the Regional Watershed uh, Association, the county government, my county, and academia, Lehigh University in Bethlehem. We'll talk a little more, like I said, about that. I uh, want to recognize right off the bat um, and uh, uh, you know, pay respect to and acknowledge um, where uh, on here in the Northeast I come from. So it's a Lenape Hoking, the land of Lenape, um, the ancestral lands of Lenape, the Delaware Indians, pretty big chunk of the Mid-Atlantic, the entire Delaware River Basin, the Lower Hudson Basin, and then eastward to Western Connecticut and um, Western Long Island northeast corner of, uh, of the state of Delaware. Uh, like I mentioned earlier, there are no, I think I did, there, the state, neither the state nor the federal government recognizes any tribes, any indigenous tribes in Pennsylvania. Uh, the Lenape Nation operates as a nonprofit. However, there are nine um, tribes in North America um, who uh, are associated with the Delaware or Lenape Nation. There are three federally recognized tribes in the U.S. Uh, the Delaware Nation in Anadarko, Oklahoma, the Delaware Tribe of Indians in Bartlesville, Oklahoma, and then the uh, Stockbridge Muncie under the Mohican Nation in um, Wisconsin. And then there are three state tribes in the state of New Jersey. The entire uh, state of New Jersey was uh, the heart, really, of the Lenape Hopi, the land of Lenape. So there are three state recognized tribes there. Um, which I guess I gotta get my flat. <laughs> You can see the Nanakoke Land of Lenape, the Ramapo Lenape Nation, and um, uh, the last one is the Pohatan Lenape in southern New Jersey. And then in the state of Delaware, there's a, a 
state recognized tribe will not be Indian tribe of Delaware. And then Canada has two First Nations that um, are connected to the uh, Lenape or Delaware people, Delaware Nation of Raventown in Ontario, and the Muncie Delaware also um, in Tompkins, Ontario. So I claim no Lenape heritage uh, or indigenous connections of any kind. Um, I am a recreation and conservation specialist. I'm not a uh, professional uh, cultural resource management type. Um, just have had a, a lifelong interest in, well, really for the last close to 25 years, really interested in the phenomena of uh, these ceremonial stone landscapes. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, where does a, a nature nerd like me go to find out more about this cool subject? Well, NERA, right? So NERA is a, a pretty amazing organization in that it's open to everybody. You don't have to be an accredited cultural resource management type, an archaeologist or an anthropologist. You can just be you know, Jim Wilson or, or a cool member and uh, get to network with really great people, some who are PhDs. You know, we had to hang out with two of the country's leading luminescence archaeologists a couple years ago. Um, we get to go on workshops, great conferences like this. Um, the top photo there is uh, a bunch of us on our OSL field tour uh, in 2020. I think that probably is here in Connecticut, staging to go out to the woods to take a sample I uh, site. Lower left there is, um, I believe that, I think that's a little low. Oh, never mind. There, that's, is that back here, Hadley? Yes. <laughs> so th th this is a field trip at a ceremonial site in uh, Bucks County, Pennsylvania. Um, uh, so we have a couple of NERA members there, as well as um, uh, folks from the Watershed Coalition. We had Allie. This is John Martin. He's the Sacred Landscape Coordinator for the Lenape Nation at PA, giving folks an introduction to the site before leading us on a walkabout. And then over here, several years ago, we were sponsored um, a professional archaeologist behind the total station there, Tom somebody, I forget his last name now. Mm -hmm. um, what was it? Tom Frolick? No. Sure. But at any rate, it was Tom the archaeologist from uh, in Quaker Town. Uh, and that was the landowner. And this is um, some NERA members um, doing a, essentially, I guess, a phase one archaeological investigation looking at this stone circle, this sort of mysterious large stone circle on Dave's property. I forget Dave's last name, too. Um, Tom Lewis. Tom Lewis, yeah. The archaeologist is Tom Lewis. And then that was um, Dave, the, uh, the landowner. Um, so you get to do really cool stuff. Um, uh, with professionals as well as um, you know, just interested lay folk uh, like, like the rest of them. So ceremonial stone landscapes, I, I suppose most of us here know what they are, but I'll just give a real quick intro again. This was a presentation I did last year um, for a general audience. Um, so who calls them that and what are they? So, uh, the ceremonial stone landscapes um, is a term that was coined uh, in about 2007 by USEC, the United South and Eastern um, Tribes, um, from a resolution that they drafted in 2007 called Sacred Ceremonial Stone Landscapes Found in the Ancestral Territories of USEC Member Tribes. So USEC is this nonprofit nerd tribal organization promoting the interest and, uh, and advocating for 33 federally recognized tribes uh, here in New England, all the way down the eastern seaboard to um, uh, Florida and across the Gulf of Mexico to East Texas. Um, uh, part of their resolution, the USEP resolution states that whether these stone structures are massive or small, stacked rows or effigies, these prayers and stone are often mistaken by archaeologists and state historic preservation offices as the efforts of farmers clearing stones for agricultural or wall building purposes. Um, so clearly there's lots of colonial and early Euro-American stone structures out there in the landscape, but there's lots that do not fit that paradigm. Um, USET uh, speaks with authority as to what these are. You know, most of the rest of us sort of academia and, and um, regulatory agencies kind of struggle with what to call them. These guys call them ceremonial stone landscapes. That's what we're calling them. That's what I'm calling them. Um, the natives would call them all Manitou Hashanash. So they're all spirit stones. But out of uh, respect, I just want to point out that the six different 
essential elements that you find in a ceremonial stone landscape. So from left to right, top to bottom, they're all dry laid, there's no mortar with them. It's just these deliberately, beautifully, often anyway, beautifully assembled stone structures, uh, dry stone walls, left to the left. Stacked stone piles or cairns, um, there. Uh, chambers, stone chambers. We were talking about niches earlier, advanced laws. Niches are sort of miniature chambers in a sense. Um, unusually uh, shaped boulders uh, that look like effigies of creatures or people. It can be naturally occurring, but then perhaps accented to look to accent the, uh, the effigy. Uh, split boulders uh, that have this split filled with smaller stones. And then perched boulders that sit um, on either uh, outcrops or bedrocks supported by smaller <coughs> stones. Um, so those are the elements standard sort of generic elements one would find in a ceremonial stone landscape. Um, now what we're going to do is um, talk about Pennsylvania real quick. So PA uh, is the 33rd largest state, so we're not huge uh, by size, area of a little over 46,000 square miles, but the fifth most populous with over 13 million people. Um, yet 60% of the Commonwealth is forested, which is pretty impressive. You know, most of those 13 million live in the metro region of the southwest, the Pittsburgh metro region, the southeast, the southern metro region. And then the Lehigh Valley, where I'm from, east in Bethlehem, Allentown, uh, the Lehigh Valley right along the, the east coast of Pennsylvania, about halfway up the Lehigh or the Delaware River. And then in the northwest corner of the state around Erie, there's a population, you know, pretty dense population. But a lot of the northern tier, the southern tier, the central part of the state is forested and peppered with um, you know, ceremonial <coughs> um, So we're going to right now take a little photo tour and look at eight sites, I think, um, in eastern Pennsylvania. I think we might be looking at about maybe seven different counties. Um, <coughs> yeah, seven counties in eastern PA. Um, I'm going to refer to them, I'll identify like the watershed in which they're found in the county. I don't want to be discreet and sensitive about, you know, releasing and identifying where these places are. But I thought I'm a watershed guy, I think in that landscape concept. And watersheds are generally, you know, tens of square miles, sometimes hundreds of square miles. So I think by just identifying the watershed in the county is a safe balance. This is the, what I call the Snake Creek Watershed Area. It's in the Snake Creek Watershed, which is a drainage to the um, Susquehanna River in Susquehanna County. It's a pretty amazing site. Um, Martin Rapp is here from New Jersey. He's been there with me. Um, my friend Angela Lambert is, um, whoops, sorry about that. Angela's there, so you can see the size, and the, the, by comparison, the size of, of, uh, of these features. So this, uh, there's about 300 uh, beautifully built uh, tabular stone cairns on probably not much of any more than two acres of land on a very steep, rocky, um, wooded slope right above uh, a perennial stream, Snake Creek, and there is a little um, stone structure built where a spring pops out to feed that little perennial creek. Um, it's an amazing site to visit. You know, we're looking at this in what, two dimensions, I guess. Uh, but if you were there in person, um, you know, you can see, I think you can probably see about a dozen cairns in some of these photos. You know, in the hillsides back there. Um, if you were there in person, you know, looking around, you can see maybe up upwards of 30 cairns. And they're just beautifully stacked. Um, the top of this slope is a big eroded outcrop of whatever this um, material is, probably a sandstone of some kind. And the, the rocky uh, ledge is eroded that, and I don't have any photos of it, but it really looks a lot like um, these, these cairns. Mm. Like the rocky ledge itself has a lot of eroded <coughs> big bowl, you know, boulders on top of it, and it's almost as if they're accenting what is above, uh, whoever built these accenting what the, the ridge top looks like. But it's a beautiful site. Uh, nothing but cans, no walls that I recall, uh, just lots and lots of cans. Um, the next site is the Delaware Water Gap National Recreation Area, CSL in Monroe County. This is a really big site, too. Several, this one's 
probably several square miles. Um, it's a complex of several sites, um, situated a couple of square miles um, on the Pennsylvania side of the Delaware River, um, right um, above the river floodplain. So these, this landscape, um, oops, um, on this landscape, uh, if you drop down this hill here, several hundred uh, yards, you come to the, the floodplain of the Delaware River. You walk out across the wide floodplain, and there'd be the river. So this is the first, um, whoops, <laughs> uh, the first uh, uh, tier above uh, above the river, and it just appears to be accented. Um, the landscape just appears to be accented. Um, you have this big uh, quartzite conglomerate there on the left top photo. Um, just bookended with some tabular stones that are piled alongside it just to accent it. Mm -hmm. This ridge line right here is the first ridge above uh, the river. I would say for every bit of a mile, there's just this single course line of stones. Some places it's two or three wide, but it only appears to be essentially one course high. Although I don't know what's really under the soil of the river. Under, but it really just runs that elevation for about a mile as it to just accent this ridge line right above the Delaware River. Another example of um, not a split boulder, just two large um, uh, pieces of bedrock that have been accented by putting in all this flat <coughs> here. This is a really cool stone wall that runs for several hundred feet. This is the east side of, uh, of the wall. It runs for a couple of hundred feet over to the west side and ends just like this on that side. So it encloses nothing, it encloses nothing. It just took somebody a lot of time, it's beautifully put together to connect one side of this ridge with the, with the, uh, the other. Mm -hmm. um, this feature here is interesting. It's a huge, probably a glacial erratic mm -hmm. with this, what almost looks like a Manitou stone underneath of it. Different kind of rock. It looks like a red sandstone to me. It was just some sort of conglomerate, I think, from, from the glaciers. Um, appears to somewhat be work like a shoulder. Uh, this feature is just uh, when I took this photo right behind me, and would have been this feature, just maybe 20 feet. Uh, this feature is this small crop boulder. Um, there's a, a stone wall behind here. Um, there's a Quite a few walls here. Almost no cairns. I think just one cairn. Uh, and interestingly enough, this site there is a Pennsylvania State Historic Preservation Office registered rock shelter um, in this landscape, within literally a stone's throw, pun intended, I guess, <laughs> of the rock shelter. Or some, not the features in these photos, but other similar features. It's called the Walters Rock Shelter. It was founded in the 1970s by uh, Don Klein, a local retired. Um, utility lineman who's an amazing amateur archaeologist. He's found lots of rock shelters over his thing. He's found many other sites that then he turns academia onto. They come out and do the, you know, the official archaeological investigation and get it registered um, for the state. <coughs> Don discovered, quote unquote, the uh, Minnesink site, the Shawnee Minnesink site in the 1960s. It's one of the oldest habitation sites in the, east, um, in the Northeast, over 12,000 years. Just a few miles downstream, really, from, from this site. But in that, that rock shelter, um, interestingly enough, and Don is completely red and against this whole CSL thing, right? I'm, I'm nuts. Um, he's not a ceremonial guy, he doesn't like that word. However, in his old age, he's pushing 90 now. He recently published about that rock shelter, because it is published and it was unique uh, in rock shelters in the mid-Atlantic. Even Temple, I think, is who excavated it was very fascinated by it, in that the only um, artifacts, with few exceptions, found inside that rock shelter were over 2,000 pot shirts, just shattered pieces of pottery, mm -hmm. that um, came from over 25 clay vessels that seemingly were deliberately taken to this rock shelter and then smashed there in place, mm -hmm. as if, you know, <laughs> <laughs> So it's kind of a mystery, I guess, to this day. Uh, we did offer a, a, the PA chapter did a, a 2018 had a field trip to this to this site. 
Okay, the Broadhead Water Creek watershed cairns. Mm -hmm. There are just cairn fields all over Monroe County, and almost all of them are in wetlands. Mm -hmm. uh, these are two different sites. The top one, oh crap, I did that again, sorry. Uh, the top uh, row um, is one site uh, in, I mean, you can see standing water here. This isn't a real, you know, mm -hmm. wetland, but a, a swamp. Um, on private property, there's about 18 cairns in a small area just in this wetland. Um, in the uplands around it, on the other side of the wetland, there are no more features, just in the wetlands. Um, this is on a, you're, you're going into uplands on the other side of the, the stone, but it's right on the edge of the wetland. This particular one has a niche, or a niche in the bottom of it. This is another similar um, cairn field just a few miles away. Same general watershed, uh, again in a wetland, similar constructive cairns. Um, this one appears to have possibly an attitude stone leaned up against it. Uh, this is in the, uh, both of these uh, cairn fields, well, actually the top one for sure is within the East Stroudsburg Municipal Watershed Authority's um, you know, watershed for their reservoirs and their, and their, um, their tanks, for this borough of East Stroudsburg. The McMichaels Creek watershed cairns, another Monroe County cairn field. This one is enormous. This is probably several square miles of hundreds of cairns. Um, the most beautiful ones are right next to public roads and um, in, in wooded front lawns. People are very proud of uh, their Indian graves. They all call them Indian graves. They love their cairns. Um, once you get away from the road, and once you're into it's a big uh, hemlock rhododendron wetland um, to the south of this, there are hundreds of cairns in there, and they're all really boogered up, like it's just the remnants of a lot of these. And in that wetland, um, there's lots of stumps of old hemlock. So I kind of think it was probably logged off at one time, maybe for uh, the tanning industry. There's a lot of tan tanners' villas right near this site. Um, so the tanning industry cutting down on the hemlock mm -hmm. uh, to, you know, to tan hides I mean, probably busted up a lot of these cairns they were pulling out of the out of the swamp. But on the hillsides above it, um, the deciduous hillsides, they're, they're still in pretty good shape. There's some really beautiful walls for this. There's also a rock shelter here. Again, a Don Klein discovered rock shelter um, somewhere. Oh, sorry, um, Don Klein discovered a rock shelter. Um, <laughs> Uh, up in, on this, up in here, this is the uh, south side of Camelback Mountain. Okay, then now we're down, so we're out of the Poconos, down to the southeastern part of the state. This is where Lee and Betty live, um, in the beautiful Pennsylvania Highlands, rough, rugged um, uh, terrain. Uh, the geology down here is just a wonderful diabase geology. So there's all these igneous intrusions that you know, came intruding up out of the the Earth, during the Triassic and the Jurassic, and they created these beautiful um, a geology that just lends naturally lends itself to looking like an effigy, right? Like looking like something. Like nobody doesn't see a turtle there, right? Nobody doesn't see I don't know a salamandery looking yeah. thing here. No one doesn't see uh, I don't know some hominoid or something. Or a, a bunch of uh, stones tra trailing off it, and you do see this a lot down there. Um, these, these boulder or stone linked boulders all over the landscape down there uh, in Shoemaker land. And of course, uh, occasionally the, the ever ubiquitous um, cairn, there are some lovely cairns down there. Um, but it's just a, it's a really a very cool uh, landscape. And um, there's a lot of these diabase boulder fields down there as you drive around, lots of big open space, a lot of it in public ownership. Uh, preserved through land trusts and then given over to the municipality to take care of. And big sprawling scout camps and just amazing stoneworks from the roads in these camps. And those boulder fields have lots of sinuous looking, deliberately built um, roads across these boulder fields, connecting some big rocks with others. It's like, what's going on here? Okay, the Pocono Creek watershed. Now we're back in the Poconos again. So this is a, a really fascinating site. Um, uh, 
John Wolfs. This isn't your work. No, it's Norman. Oh, it is. It's okay. Yeah. So this is Norman. Norm Muller um, uh, knows of this site, the this sketch map. Uh, it's just a very unique site, uh, right above Pocono Creek. So this hill slope drops down, drops real steeply down to now it's State Highway PA 611. Across 611, and there's Pocono Creek. Mm -hmm. So. It's very processional when you're there, you feel like you're on some sort of a, a ceremonial stone landscape. Mm -hmm. There's this processional way that comes down through, it ends up here, and then there's four, you can see four stone terraces. Mm -hmm. My friend D is standing on one of the top terraces, and then there's three more below her, and then just would look out over into the floodplain of Pocono Creek. Uh, on this wall right around here, or maybe it's right there, does that say? Small chamber. Yeah, small chamber. It's that. That's a niche mm -hmm. or a small chamber mm -hmm. in this wall. This mm -hmm. is that wall. That's this wall here. Mm -hmm. um, there's you know some cairns here there uh, at this site, but uh, really great site. It was uh, slated for development, um, and it was developed. It was purchased and developed by Big Water Park um, and. Uh, the Lenape Nation of PA and some of we Stoneworks enthusiasts back in 2000, you know, lobbied. Um, they got in here with the, the developer and they promised to steer clear. They pretty much did, although um, this wall here is breached somewhat, um, was definitely partially breached for a, a, a water line. Mm -hmm. There's always water drinking. Uh, Castle Rocks. So this is a site uh, in Luzerne County. Dave Kukowski is a member of this organization and he owns this site. It's a pretty spectacular um, site situated right on the watershed divide between the Susquehanna and the Delaware River basins. Um, the core site consists of these um, four, I think it's one, two, three, four, big me megalithic boulders um, that either deliberately or by happenstance are lined up such um, that they, uh, th there's some solstice, uh, winter solstice and sunset and other solar event connections to these alignments. In 2019, here at PH, I did a field trip here Spectacular view looking out over the, the Susquehanna River Valley. Um, uh, Dave Gutowski has uh, invested a lot of his own time and money in the research here and has this registered with PA SHIPA and more recently discovered a rock shelter right on the same site that he calls the Appenglow rock mm -hmm. shelter. Mm -hmm. It too has been registered um, with the Commonwealth. And now we've got the, the Berlin Walls. <clears throat> um, so this is interesting, this is one of my favorite sites. It's not the coolest looking site, but this is one where I worked in collaboration with Norm Muller. Norm's an incredible researcher. Um, uh, this site's first recorded um, by a guy named Alfred Berlin, hence the name why he dubbed it Berlin Walls. Um, uh, he first records it uh, in a September 1887 edition of the American Antiquarian and Oriental Journal. I just want to read to you what he says. He says, hidden from view in a dense woods on the south side of the Kittatinny of Blue Mountain in Northampton County, PA, is situated an ancient structure which I wish to bring to notice. Here can be seen extending from near the summit to the base of the mountain, a gully from four to eight feet wide, I'm sorry, from four to eight feet deep, irregular in width and about one mile in length. So this thing, you know, uh, 130 some years ago, it was a mile long. Um, along and on each side of this natural incision is placed a line of stones irregularly thrown together and varying in height. So you, oh gosh, sorry about that. Um, here's the wall, right? This is one wall, here's another. In one of these photos, I think it's the bottom right. I tried to get, yeah, I did try to get both walls. So this is one wall, this is the incision of the gully, mm -hmm. and that's the other wall over there. Mm -hmm. So it's just this natural inside stormwater gully from millennia of stormwater 
and has washed off the mountainside that created this gully that for some reason was special enough to be accented for nearly a mile. These two walls went down that mountainside for a mile. Mm -hmm. And at the bottom, they kind of turned in on themselves and there was, according to the literature from Berlin, there were all these little lateral walls that shot off from it. Mm -hmm. um, Today, only about 1,400 linear feet survive on the steep wooden slope of the Blue Mountains State Game Land, so it's protected. The, the remaining 4,000 feet have been long obliterated in you know, late 19th century, 20th century, 21st century land development farms, you know, housing, uh, utilities, etc. So there's no sign of, uh, of the stones otherwise. But it was, Norm loved the idea that he was able to find, um, and we found this together in other instances too. Um, you know, historical source reference to these things that native, and then actually relocate them, you know, on the landscape today and kind of document them. So this is really cool. I found this actually after two days of hunting for it. Um, the author, uh, Berlin, says it was so many, so many miles west of um, Little Gap, so many miles east of Lehigh Water Gap. So on Super Bowl Sunday, uh, 2021, that's how nerdy I am. <laughs> I was out in the woods and found this. And somebody was talking about a tingling sensations. Um, when, I, this, when I finally found this, it was late in the day. I was at the bottom of the slope. Um, there's a subdivision below me on the game lands. And I saw the sun was setting such that it was illuminating the mountain, that face of the mountain, the south face of the mountain. And there was this big flock of wild turkeys feeding up the hill, and as I got closer and looked, they were literally in between these walls. Mm. Yeah, mm. that's actually the side. They were literally in between these walls. They're just working their way up slope, scratching at acorns, and it was like, oh, <laughs> that's pretty cool. So this book, real quick, uh, I'm going to go on the history of any place names in Pennsylvania, written by George P. Donahue in 1928. Donahue was the secretary of what was then the Pennsylvania Historical Commission. That's today's Pennsylvania Historical Museum Commission. It's the state history agency that houses the State Historic Preservation Office. So he was the top dog appointed to that by the governor, like they all are, like today's uh, secretary of that same agency. He wrote this book. And he had, includes in it an appendix, and this is where Norm found the article. The appendix is called um, Prehistoric Works in PA. Uh, in that reference, in that appendix, um, Pennsylvania has 37 counties. 32 counties are listed with hundreds of stone features in each county. That's mm -hmm. like just the primary source reference, and then Norm did the paper chase, found the document, sent it to me, sent me out the books. Mm -hmm. But, you know, I don't know when that paradigm shifted because the top dog of PHMC back then wrote a book with citing hundreds of stone features all across the state. He calls them pyramids in lots of places. Mm -hmm. um, so, okay, now to Oli Hills. Okay, so this is the um, um, a pretty amazing site in Berks County, PA, in the Lehigh Creek watershed. There's about 90 constructed stone features. This is a geo, oh, sorry geo reference map uh, that John John Waltz, you did do this one, at least you're getting credit for it. Yeah, the overlay, I guess. Okay. Matched up with the LIDAR. That's, you know, that's a LIDAR image. Right. And I guess we flooded this stuff over the top of that, yeah. So John's been working with Norm Muller for decades at this site, researching it, and um, thanks to Norm's perseverance and hard work over the years, um, in 2020 we finally got the State Historic Preservation Office out here to walk it. They were blown away by it, and they went back to their office in Harrisburg and immediately went to work on registering it with the uh, Archaeological Site Survey as a Native American or pre-contact um, site. 14 wooded acres. Um, with amazing features, some really big monumental stoneworks, as well as lots of smaller satellite things. Um, it's a case study in, in researching, thanks to Norm's efforts and John's, and then dating these structures by luminescence dating, which we'll learn all about and more about anyway tomorrow. Um, again, it was put into, uh, it's been registered, and I don't know 
uh, Walter Vaughn, the website. Do we have a link to Hannah's article? Uh, Hannah Harvey was the registered um, professional archaeologist with P.A. Shippo who wrote, who recorded this and then wrote a great blog on the P.A. Um, Shippo has a blog spot and she wrote a great article called Finding Meeting in Stone all about this site and how uh, you know, it's really starting to uh, um, you know, shift the paradigm. Um, again, that's, you know, that's this site. Okay, the site, lots of research, a long history um, of research here at this site. Uh, you know, Norm Mahler started going here in the 1990s, um, recording it. Uh, this is um, a field trip um, that uh, this guy right here, Fred Werkheiser, um, who Norm met in the 1990s after hearing about the Old Hill site, through Fred's best buddy from the school days, who was living up here, the but Mark Strohmeyer has since passed. He and Norm's paths crossed. Mark told him all about this amazing Oli Hill site. Um, long story longer, I guess, in the end. Norm visits the site and has invested decades of research here. Um, no matter who we would bring here, it was always dismissed as being something other than native. It was agricultural or it was industrial because the company line always, and up until now forever, has been Native Americans in Pennsylvania, in substitute Mid-Atlantic Northeast, did not practice a stone building tradition. So thank you for your interesting inquiry. Mr. Wilson, have a lovely day. So that was always the standard fat line. And whoever took this photo, this lady right here was a state archaeologist from, I think, Maryland. This was a 2002 field trip that Fred organized with his nephew, who was an attorney in Washington, D.C., who specializes in historic preservation of, of prop, historic properties. Got this archaeologist to come up. Here we are at Ely Hills, like the mecca of CSLs in Eastern PA. At this huge site, this is a great, massive tour, big eroded piece of outcrop that seems to be the central focus there. And, and here's uh, this lady completely dismissing it as industrial, with no other qualifications, like what industry you know, creates that sort of artifact? No, no. Mm -hmm. But she's telling us now, and the photo was taken, this is Fred, this is me, this is mm -hmm. Norm Muller, um, Don Repscher. Um, Fred, I mean, I can see his face, the smirk, he's looking mm -hmm. away like in just disgust. <laughs> Are you kidding me? Um, but yeah, always dismissed. But the great article a couple years ago, um, folks, I guess, in this organization interviewed Norman. It was a very full uh, length article about Norm um, and, and all the research that he's done uh, here. He's you know, published many articles about the site. Some of them have even been published in the British Archaeological Review in 2008, and another American archaeologist uh, just two years ago, like some prestigious um, Jim? papers. Jim? Yes? If you were to, from the photograph on the left, from the person who's taking that photograph, if you were to turn around 180 degrees, just about, you'd see that other picture. This, yeah. Yes. Wow. Right. Yes. Yeah, it's just an amazing landscape. Um, it's surreal. Like when I pe take people there or show them pictures who are not us, they don't know stone mm -hmm. They're like, it looks, they say they, it looks ominous to them. Um, they say it looks like it would be the portrait of a Stephen King novel. <laughs> There's nothing <laughs> agricultural about it or industrial. It's uh, almost like spooky. Mm -hmm. you know? and, it's, and, and these features are huge at this particular mm -hmm. site, like really super size. So, um, uh, what did we do next? Uh, okay, just here's the Oli Hills again. So, uh, um, again, uh, just some of the really beautiful features. Uh, this, oh, I'm sorry. Uh, this feature, this, this is the same feature. Um, there was a ladder against a tree one day when I was here, so I got this pretty cool photo of it, but that's the same feature from the side. This is the feature you saw covered in snow on that article uh, that on the cover of the New York uh, Journal. Again, that, that mm. iconic. Mm -hmm. And then this feature here, we took a sample 
um, a stone uh, sample from this for OSL testing next uh, last year. We'll talk a little bit you know, more about that later. But so the idea that there could be a pre-contact ceremony of stone in the landscape, um, let alone stone constructions of native origin in Eastern PA, is generally dismissed by the archaeology community. Um, again, Native Americans PA did have a stone building tradition, and this is by, uh, right, out, right out of the blog spot that. Um, uh, Hannah Harvey wrote. So she goes on to say, after looking at the site, that the traditional archaeological perspective, this is in that blog, uh, would attribute these constructions to historic period field clearing practices, but these features exhibit a level of careful, labor intensive, and at times artistic effort that does not readily conform to the idea that they are agricultural in mm -hmm. origin. Mm -hmm. um, and it certainly doesn't, right? So. Um, <coughs> They're almost never associated, there's almost never associated artifacts with them to try to figure out you know, what area they might have come from. But uh, more recently, um, Nira has uh, reached out to delve into the world of uh, luminescence dating. So there are now ways to date these structures um, using uh, luminescence, which I won't even go there to learn more about that uh, tomorrow. I guess suffice it to say that luminescence dating is a group of methods that can determine how long ago mineral grains were last exposed to sunlight. So in a lab, natural radiation in ordinary sediments can be released as light in a lab and measured as time. Mm -hmm. So it's pretty high science. We'll learn all about that tomorrow. We'll learn about that tomorrow from Dr. Feathers. And, uh, and even Vance is leading a, a workshop about that. So in 2018, Norm's dream was to get a, a sample, a stone or sediment sample from the Oli Hill site for luminescence dating at the Luminescence Lab in Seattle, Washington. So uh, it was Father's Day Sunday, 2018. A team of us, uh, Norm, of course. Um, here's John, you're in here, right? John Walt. Yeah. Uh, Corey Newlander was an archaeologist from uh, Prince mm -hmm. University. Dr. Jim Feathers gave us the protocol to follow in the field to, to take the sample. Uh, Dr. Newlander was a local archaeologist who came out and stood over us, you know, and made sure we get it right. Followed the protocol, which we did. And, uh, well, sorry about that. A little, uh, uh, some, some of the guys had a little powwow here before we actually get to work. And here's John Waltz with us here. Um, you ready to get into a tent that is then uh, covered in tarps so that the sample is taken in total pitch darkness. Mm -hmm. So if you have a red headlamp on, um, which is not going to bleach out the um, uh, radiation in a stone. So it has to be collected in darkness, um, wrapped up in opaque. Aluminum, aluminum foil in black plastic right. bags. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and you'll see more about that actually. <laughs> But there's a, a tent. John's in there going to town, <laughs> sampling, going down. The yeah, that's that, that's a really that's a pretty good picture. Um, if you see on the left side, that's the tour. That's that yeah, big here. Er erratic tour that, yeah. that you saw in the, one of the previous pictures, the first picture actually. Mm -hmm. And then this is taken from kind of down down below on, right. on the south looking north and up to the mm -hmm. to the platform to the terrace yeah the north the tent, tall, is the terrace, terrace. Mm -hmm. yeah it's pretty tall that's about eight to ten feet tall and then that's the interior of a brand new coleman tent with four ripped out so we're getting there to do our thing so the results of this come back um, the results uh, were published in the North American Archaeologist in 2020 in an article co-written by Dr. Feathers and Norm. Uh, the article is titled Optically Stimulated Luminescence Dating of a Probable Native American Cairn and Wall Site in Eastern PA. And in that article, Dr. Feathers goes on to say the BC 70, that's what I didn't mention that, so it comes back to being about 2,600 years old. So BC 570 plus or minus 330 years. So um, uh, there certainly weren't any Pennsylvania, German, or Scotch-Irish 
guys and even stones around Berks County. Uh, <laughs> so, Dr. Feather says that the BC 578 fits well with the date range of the Adena, and the Mound Builders, uh, which was centered to the west. Although artifacts associated with the Adena have been found in western PA and eastern Ohio, people were moving large amounts of dirt around at that time. It is not inconceivable that contemporaries to their east were moving around large amounts of rocks. And I just I kind of threw this graphic together because I thought it was kind of interesting. Like there's the Great Appalachian Valley with all the smaller valleys listed in, in between there. Uh, even my Lehigh Valley. PA. So uh, you know, we know that there are flat top earth and stone mounds found scattered throughout the Appalachian Valley, right? Um, from uh, the Etowah Mounds in Coosa, Alabama, Georgia, the Pinson Mounds in Tennessee, okay, these are big earth and flat top mm -hmm. mounds. And then you get up here into the Northeast. This is a site at the Oli Hills site in Berks County, flat top stone camp. This is, I think, here in Connecticut somewhere. Um, that's in north from Wyndham County, Connecticut. I believe this photo is wrong. So, you know, it's just, you know, it's food for thought. Like, look at the similarities, right? <laughs> Listen to what Dr. You know, Feathers has to say, that it's not you know, kind of conceivable that perhaps it was an Adena like culture um, practicing this stone building tradition. Um, so, now I'll kind of, kind of wrap up here. Um, and again, this was what we. Uh, did for the presentation last year. So we'll go on a little field tour here, another photo tour with our 10 days out in the field two years ago. Um, NERA appropriated and approved, I think, $20,000 um, for OSL research. It's not, it's not cheap, it's expensive. Um, but uh, stepped up and, and uh, pledged that money to go out and sample. So coming on two years ago, 10 days in September, there was a team of NERA volunteers along with um, two of the countries preeminent luminescence archaeologists, um, put in 1,200 miles, drove around four states. What states do we hit, guys? It was New York, mm -hmm. New Hampshire, um, Rhode Island, Connecticut. Pennsylvania. No, not that year we did. <laughs> um, but yeah, it was Connecticut, Rhode Island, New York, and New Hampshire. Uh, we visited 11 ceremonial stone landscape locations and sampled 20 stone structures at those 11 locations. Accumulated 76 pounds of stone and sediments and shipped that to the lab in, um, in Seattle. And we'll hear about uh, the results of that, I believe, tomorrow. So um, uh, here's the our luminescence archaeologist, Dr. Marie Kroon, runs the um, luminescence lab at Stony Brook College in Long Island. And then Dr. Jim Feathers is going to be zooming in with us tomorrow. Runs the luminescence lab um, at the University of Washington in Seattle. And Nira, you know, is, is you know, part of this part of this protocol. So the way. Okay, so just seven quick steps. Um, uh, we're out there in the field. Um, steps one and two, we break away the leaf litter and the duff along the structure, uh, shovel down alongside the structure to its base, or first source of stonework. Ideally, we try to get a sediment sample from underneath the structure and not even mess with the stonework uh, at all. Um, take the sample in total darkness with either a soil probe, like Dr. Feathers is doing at the bottom, or under tarps, um, like some of the other folks. Um, with the floor cut out and under multiple layers, um, completely to prevent any uh, sunlight, mm -hmm. um, take the sample uh, and then secure the, the samples um, you know, in those opaque baggies. Um, steps three and four, uh, uncover archaeologists and then continue to secure those samples mm -hmm. even more so, label them, get them ready to be shipped um, to the lab. Steps five and six. Uh, install a dosimeter um, either side. Uh, put the dosimeter in a little PVC pipe and then place the dosimeter where the sample was taken. So this is used to measure the ambient radiation that will accumulate at this site over the course of one year. So they were put in there uh, in September of 2020. Um, assuming last September of 2021. <coughs> Here, so here in this neck of the woods went out and retrieved those samples. Um, 
The dosimeter is made of doped calcium sulfate, crimped inside a piece of copper tubing, and then placed in a piece of narrow PVC pipe, inserted in the sampling site flag so that it can be easily relocated. And that is uh, mailed back to the lab in Seattle, and um, it's analyzed in the lab, and the metrics from it go into the, the metrics for you know, coming up with a final date um, for construction. So, six, step seven, uh, <coughs> plenty of measurements, photos, uh, notes, and, um, and sketches. So you carefully record each site in, in detail, GPS coordinates, you know, exercise and best documentation and coordination uh, practices, you know, measurements above ground, below ground, soil geology and site conditions, sketches with lots of notes and photographs, and all of this data becomes part of the chain of custody that follows these samples back to the lab in Seattle. Okay, so again, I showed this presentation a year ago in March. Um, we knew the very next month, April of 2021, a subset of uh, these mass OSL samples from 2020 came to Pennsylvania uh, a year ago now, um, a year ago this past week, I think, and we sampled uh, a bunch of sites down in PA. And I'm going to talk about that and save that for tomorrow's um, update, um, but a number of us uh, visited PA, talk more about that. Another exciting uh, piece of uh, primary source documentation that that's corroborated in the field. This is a document, it's a sketch map, an 1870s sketch map. Sketched in 1870 by a, an old guy at the time who was trying to remember um, what Hexenkopf Ridge looked like from his youth. So Hexenkopf Ridge is this very interesting um, geologic feature in Williams Township, Northampton County. Fraser Watershed has an interesting Pennsylvania powwow History to it, it's kind of like a witch doctor, Christian witch doctor kind of thing that Pennsylvania Germans were all into. Um, uh, but also a lot of Native American connections. And uh, this sketch map, uh, the, the author of the sketch map talks about a, a quartz placed in rock cleft by Indians. That would be number two, which I think is here. We never found that. I found it. What's that? I found it. Oh, you found Ooh, it? it yeah. Put it back, Frank. <laughs> <laughs> um, but number three here, or is that two? Whatever. Okay, three is up here. Uh, Indian mounts, three feet high, 20 feet long. Bingo. Here's one of them. So we did sample. Uh, we sampled one of the features here um, last April. And again, we'll talk more about that uh, tomorrow. And then just kind of wrap up here, I think, partnerships again. I'll talk about partnerships tomorrow, but the big one. The New York can really be proud of is this relationship we've established with the Pennsylvania State Historic Preservation Office, which really wants to work with us to develop um, a, a PA stone landscape project. We had a Zoom, was it a Zoom call, Walter, or was it just a conference call in 2020? Okay, all this started in March of 2020. I got, we got Heather out to the Olney Hills in March of 2020, the first week or so with an itinerary to hit about four more sites. And then what happened, like, in the second week of March 2020? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that shut it down. Unfortunately, we did have some conference calls into the pandemic. I don't even, I think these guys are still working remotely. So I do reach out to them from time to time, the folks at SHPO, PA, and State Historic Preservation Office, and say, hey, we're still here and interested. And they're, yeah, yeah, we are too. And as soon as things go back to normal, whatever that might be, um, we'll, we'll work with you. So the, the idea is to develop a documentation protocol with nomenclature and reporting forms for recording CSL across the state. Um, we collaborate, NERA and, and uh, PA SHPO, on a long-term multi-year project to document CSLs using citizen volunteers. We conduct training workshops with SHPO staff introducing the PA CSL site report form and including field trips to actually document sites in the field with SHPO staff and citizens uh, volunteers. Um, of course, in consultation with um, uh, all the native uh, folks who had a historical connection um, to Pennsylvania. And Pennsylvania Historical State the Museum Commission uses the same roster of native uh, indigenous people, I guess, PennDOT used, or Pennsylvania State 
highway department, you know, consults with uh, historical tribes who had connections to PA and road projects and things like that. So but we definitely have the native representation there. Uh, and like Doug Harris, you know, the local native voice for um, CSL says that you know, collaboration is certainly at the heart of preservation. So NEAR is doing a really good job, uh, I, I believe, of trying to collaborate with as many partners as possible. So that is pretty much my presentation. Great. Thank you.